<laughs> let me say off the bat, what a pleasure it is to return to Lummi Island. I think maybe for my third annual meeting that I've been with all of you. Um, but even beyond that, I have to tell you that some of my earliest childhood memories are from Lummi Island and from playing on the beach at Ligo Bay in front of, uh, I believe it was the Hollies who had a, uh, uh, a little marina there. They had a little marina and you could store your boat there and these people would launch your boat when you needed to go to your family cabin on Orcas Island, which is what we did. So when I was a child, we would come from Bellingham to Lummi Island and my brother and I would play on the beach while the boat was launched and then we would go for a wonderful trip. Uh, over to Orcas. So many, many fond memories of Lummi. Of course, you know, things were quite different. There's been a lot of change since those days in the early 1970s. I mean, that was, no one was dreaming of Zoom meetings at the time. Uh, computers, the internet, you know, cell phones and, and social media, all of these things were not even dreamed of. So lots of change in the human world over those decades and lots of change in the natural world at the same time. You know, incredible change to, to weather patterns and an incredible change to uh, you know, the, the species that surround us. Brown pelicans now are a regular visitor to our waters. Keep your eyes peeled for brown pelicans moving northward, never dreamed of uh, in my youth. And now they are regular visitors here. So changes in nature, not just over the course of, of a lifetime like mine, which, which isn't that long, I'll have you know, but I suppose it's longer than it was uh, earlier. I guess that's how it works. Um, but even over the course of, of my young son's life, observable changes in the natural history of his world, in that he too grew up on beaches here in the islands of the Pacific Northwest, where like many of us, he observed and admired and counted and adored the big purple pie starfish clinging to the rocks and the occasional orange one as well, only to see them disappear, virtually disappear from our waters. A major ecological shift because I have to tell you, if you've ever heard of the, of the, the phrase keystone species, pie was the original keystone species. The term was coined to describe the incredible effects that Pisaster has on the intertidal community. So we can see changes in nature playing out over the course of a child's life in our immediate surroundings. Now we can point to all sorts of reasons for change. Of course, technology in, in our human lives, uh, we can point to you know, habitat loss changing things for many species out there. But, you know, an overarching driver of change now in nature, and even I will argue to you in human societies is of course the, the warming temperatures of our planet. And that's what I wanna to talk to you tonight about. Talk to you about the biology of climate change. And, Why? It's, it's like I invented that. We've got some technology right there. Uh, someone texting in to say, yes, more, more climate change. So we're going to talk about biology of climate change this evening. Uh, and we're going to start with an image that has become iconic, really, for that topic, one we have, we've grown accustomed to. Now, let me just add that one other thing that I love about speaking in a place like Lummi Island is that I know that I can wear a headlamp during my lecture and no one's gonna bat an eye. <laughs> and you know, I probably could have worn my extra tough boots uh, and those would have, would have flown just as well. Uh, so bear with me now while I uh, illuminate my notes so that we don't all get lost along the way. Thank you, by the way. Who was it who loaned to me the headlamp this evening? Thank you very much, a lifesaver. Um, so I wanted to begin then with this iconic image that we've, we've grown to know so well, the polar bear on the shrinking iceberg. We've seen this everywhere for decades. It is our go-to symbol for the biological impacts of climate change. So iconic that, in my opinion, the conversation far too often stops there. We invoke the, pol the poor polar bear, and then we move on to policy and, and other 
discussions, the causes of climate change, and, and we never revisit this incredible story of biology that's really at the, at the heart of all climate change scenarios. We keep overlooking that because after all, it is the most important thing. What matters is how species, plants and animals respond to rapid change. That's what's going to determine the future. I mean, if every species got along just as well in, in all sorts of conditions, then tweaking the weather one way or another wouldn't matter in the slightest. But we know that's not how nature works. The diversity of life on this planet is this wonderful accumulation of millions of species that have adapted to particular environmental conditions. And when those conditions change, those species react. And it is the sum of those reactions that will determine the future, not only theirs, but our own as well. So this evening, I want to focus our time on the challenges that climate change creates for plants and animals, and on how we can, we can already measure and see their responses playing out in nature all around us. And we won't be talking very much about the atmospheric stuff. We won't be talking too much about the process of climate change itself with one notable exception, carbon dioxide, CO2. Has there ever been a substance so often invoked and so seldom explained? Now, when I started out on this book project, on the research for this book, I realized that I knew hardly anything about the stuff that was causing the planet to warm in the first place. I mean, yes, I remember my high school biology textbook, and I do recall that the CO2 molecule was portrayed in this fashion, you know, with the big black ball in the middle, the carbon atom bookended by these two red balls, the, uh, the oxygen on either side. And I remember at the time thinking, you know, that looks exactly like the head of the red-eyed fruit flies that we just spent the last semester studying in biology. A and that connection always stayed with me so that years later, when this link between CO2 and climate change became so notorious, all I could picture was the, the tailpipes and smokestacks of the world spewing forth these clouds of flies, uh, which was a very vivid image, but it didn't really help me in explaining or understanding the situation. Because carbon dioxide is something of a paradox. I mean, here it is, this global threat that is nonetheless one of the building blocks for life on Earth. It's everywhere, it's ubiquitous in the atmosphere which helps explain why it was the first atmospheric gas ever to be isolated and identified. In fact, before the discovery of carbon dioxide, scientists weren't quite sure whether the atmosphere contained anything at all. They didn't know what was in there, what it was made of, if you could even measure it. Now, credit for the discovery and much of the early work on CO2 comes to us from this fellow here, Joseph Priestley, a really incredible 18th century scientist, also a clergyman. He was a, you know, a biologist and a chemist. He was a good friend of Benjamin Franklin's. He was an all around polymath. And Priestley in turn credits his work on carbon dioxide to the fact that he was quote, living for some time in the neighborhood of a public brewery. And at that brewery, he found quantities of this colorless, odorless gas gathering above the fermentation fats. He was also fortunate enough to find brewers who were patient and they allowed their local vicar to build a scaffold over the top of those brewing vats and then begin lowering all, in all manner of experiments into that gas to try to figure out what this stuff was. Now he learned that it would snuff out a candle flame. And he determined that it was very heavy because he could see that the smoke from that snuffed flame would, would follow the gas down and spread across the brewery floor. He saw that animals could not breathe whatever this stuff was. And he found that he could dissolve it in water. And in doing so, he could produce a fizzy beverage, which he said had a, quote, pleasant acidulous taste. 
Now that breakthrough earned him the prestigious Copley Medal from the Fellows of the Royal Society of London, but it earned an awful lot more for Johann Schwepp, <laughs> who read Priestley's paper and founded the tonic and soda water company that still bears his name. Now Priestley's work paved the way for all sorts of other experiments. People started working on this gas and they soon realized that carbon dioxide could retain heat. And as early as the 1890s predicted that industrial activities were putting enough of this stuff into the atmosphere to potentially warm the planet. In the 1890s, we knew this, right? Of course, now that work was done uh, by Arrhenius up in snowy Sweden, where the idea of adding a few extra degrees to the atmosphere was generally greeted with gusto. But it remains that we've known for a long time that carbon dioxide was a greenhouse gas. Still, no matter how much soda water we drink, it doesn't explain to us this paradox of why some carbon dioxide is bad, and yet some of it is benign, even necessary for life on this planet. So to get my head around that distinction and to get my hands on some real live CO2, I decided to conduct a little experiment at home with my son Noah on the various contents of our refrigerator. And I would like to share that story with you now. Uh, it comes from the book from the second chapter, which begins with a quotation attributed to Galileo. He said, we must measure all that is measurable and strive to make measurable all that is not. It turns out that fermentation occurs in a lot more places than vats of beer. Yogurt and cheese makers call it culturing, but it's more accurate to think of it as a form of slow microbial digestion, a way for bacteria and other tiny organisms to extract and use energy from the foods they live within and around. Like any form of digestion, it is a process that produces waste. Luckily for food lovers, the byproducts of fermentation include things like alcohol, thus the beer, and lactic acid, which adds tanginess and pungency to such cultured favorites as kimchi and buttermilk. Now, most fermentation also produces carbon dioxide, which is what had me combing through the back reaches of our fridge. A container of organic sauerkraut advertised probiotic punch and claimed it's alive. But any organisms that kraut might have once contained had long since shuffled off their mortal coils and were no longer producing even a whiff of carbon dioxide. A lit match held above the briny mix burned brightly. Experiments with yogurt and sour cream were similarly disappointing, but then we hit the jackpot. On the bottom shelf, behind the bags of carrots and celery sat a half gallon jar of homemade pickles. They had been stewing in their own juices since August and tasted yeasty as well as sour, suggesting that fungi had joined the bacteria in their digestive pursuits. Frankly, it was past time, far past time, to throw the pickles out. But for once, procrastinating a chore had paid off. As soon as Noah and I brought a match near that open lid, the flame demonstrated why carbon dioxide is such a common ingredient in fire extinguishers. With no oxygen to burn, the match went out in an instant, as if we'd turned off a switch. What's more, smoke from the snuffed tip curled downward, trapped in the gas, just as Priestley had described. It's pouring down the side, Noah exclaimed, watching as wisps of smoke followed the heavy vapors over the jar rim and down to spread across the countertop. That's it, I told him. You saw the carbon dioxide. He quickly brought me back to Earth. I didn't see the carbon dioxide, Papa. I saw the smoke. <laughs> but like Priestley before us, we could use that smoke to watch the gas, defining its boundaries as it flowed and swirled around the open jar. For a few minutes, our kitchen was filled with the thrill of discovery as we lit match after match, watching them snuff and smolder until all the carbon dioxide had dissipated into the surrounding air. A simple experiments often lead to broader insights and repeating Priestley's fermentation trick brought up an obvious question. Do pickles cause climate change? 
Does making uh, beer? The answer, of course, is no. But understanding why some carbon emissions are harmless while others are not reveals a basic truth about climate change that we rarely stop to think about. In the case of the pickle jar, the carbon came from the cucumbers and the brine. And the cucumbers got it from the air around our garden the previous summer. Like plants everywhere, their growth relies upon photo photosynthesis, that leafy process of combining CO2 with water and energy from the sun to create starches. In other words, carbon dioxide puts the carbo in carbohydrates. When those starches break down, the carbon dioxide goes back into the atmosphere. This is the step in the Earth's carbon cycle with which we are most familiar, because we play a role in it every moment of every day. Whether we eat plants or eat animals that have eaten plants, the energy that fuels our bodies traces right back to those photosynthetic starches. And we release carbon dioxide with every exhaled breath. But in terms of climate change, breathing is like making pickles guilt-free. That's because our bodies are just one short step on the carbon cycle, as carbon makes its continuous circuit from the air through plants and animals and back again, with no net gain or loss. And if that's all there was to the story, then the planet wouldn't be warming. I wouldn't be giving this lecture. The reality of modern carbon change hinges on one key fact. Not all plants break down. Consider the pickle. Cucumbers eaten fresh or left to rot in the garden release their carbon right away, but that process slows down considerably in a jar of salty brine. Under the right conditions, it can stop altogether. In nature, this occurs primarily in two locations, the ocean floor and boggy wetlands. When marine algae die in mass and sink to the seabed, they sometimes get buried before they are eaten or decomposed. Dead plants in bogs can also accumulate with little decay, forming layer upon layer of peat. In either case, if sedimentary rocks develop above and around these organic deposits, their carbon is effectively trapped and removed from the atmosphere, removed from that active carbon cycle for millions of years. Transformed by heat, pressure, and age, we recognize these ancient plants as the fossil fuels. Petroleum from the algae, coal from the peat, and natural gas, which comes from either. So burning them all now, all at once, releasing all of that stockpiled carbon dioxide into the air overwhelms that active carbon cycle, leading to the accumulation of CO2 and the many consequences now unfolding. <laughs> So I guess the take home message there is the next time you find something in the back of your fridge that looks like a scientific experiment, it is a scientific experiment. There is a lot to be learned right there in your own refrigerator. And it's also a good reminder that even the atmospheric aspects of modern climate change are rooted in biology. So we know that the climate is warming and we know why. But what does all that mean for plants, as, plants and animals? Now, as you can imagine, this is a very active field of study. Climate impacts are so widespread that it's not too much of an exaggeration to say that all biologists are studying climate change. Some of them just don't know it yet. It helps to organize this deluge of information into themes. And one of the most common themes has to do with timing. At Walden Pond, for example, the violets and wood sorrel that Henry David Thoreau admired in May and June now bloom in late April. And what he called, quote, that early yellow smell of willows can reliably be savored in March. Spring is arriving earlier and earlier. You can see it happen in your own yard. And if you write your observations down, as Thoreau did, they might one day become valuable. His meticulous notes on the plants and birds at Walden are now a vital baseline for modern comparison, modern comparisons of all kinds. One expert told me that if Thoreau was listed as a co-author on all of the papers now using his data, he would be one of the most prolific climate change scientists of the 21st century. 
But a modern spring isn't just earlier than what Thoreau saw, it's different. To Thoreau, it might seem like a season in disarray. That's because species are not all responding at the same time or in the same ways to climate change. Here's a flower you may recognize from your meadows here on Lummi Island. It's known as death cannons, common throughout our region. And like many plants, it produces toxins to ward off would-be attackers. But unlike most other plants, it doesn't just put those chemicals into its leaves and seeds and other places that are likely to be nibbled. It puts them everywhere, including into its pollen and its nectar. And what's more, the main toxin in that mix, zygosine, is particularly nasty stuff. It attacks the heart, attacks the lungs, and for good measure, it attacks the digestive tract. So you have an upset stomach while you perish. Its Latin name really says it all, Toxicoscordion venenosum venenosum, which translates to poisonous bull, poisonous, poisonous. So death camas is very well protected, but in terms of pollination, it's in a bit of a fix. I mean, how do you go about attracting insects to your flowers when instead of a tasty reward, you're offering them seizures, <laughs> paralysis, and yes, death? So enter the appropriately named death canis bee, one of only a handful of species and the only bee that has figured out a way to tolerate or even detoxify death canis poison. Now that gives the bee an exclusive source of pollen, and nectar, and it gives the flower a very dedicated pollinator. It's a tight, very specialized, and very uh, co-evolved relationship. But in many locations, including right here, death camas now blooms two weeks earlier than it did just 30 years ago. Responding to the steady rise in springtime temperatures, the bee, on the other, can on the other hand, appears to be remaining on the old schedule. It nests below the ground. The soil warms more slowly than the surface temperatures and air temperatures to which the plant is largely responding. So if that trend continues, it could lead to what biologists call a timing mismatch, separating these species not in space, but in time. Flowers too early for their bee and the bees too late for their flower. So specialized relationships like this kind of pollination are particularly vulnerable to timing mismatch. But we're seeing these things crop up all over the place from migrating caribou arriving at their calving grounds past the peak of the vegetation protection that's uh, the productivity that they were relying upon to raise their calves. To, to birds in migration arriving at tidal flats, again, past the peak or before the peak in some cases, in productivity of the invertebrates that they were counting upon to fuel their long, long journeys. Of course, it can take decades of research to unravel and understand the mismatches that are now forming or playing out around us, but there are other climate change challenges that are more immediate, extremes, for example, increasingly harsh climatic conditions that simply push species beyond their comfort zone. Storms, floods, droughts, sometimes simply high temperatures. One expert told me, you know, sometimes organisms just get too hot. And one such example comes to us from the deserts of the American Southwest, where you might expect that creatures would be well prepared for a warmer world. After all, they're living in the hottest place in North America. Now, Barry Sinervo is a herpetologist at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and he studies lizards, including the Western fence lizard, this character here, uh, a species that if your childhood was anything like mine, you might have tried and failed to catch. Failed because they always scurried away at the last moment to hide under a nearby rock. Well, it turns out that fence lizards use rocks for a lot more than evading young lizard enthusiasts. They are what scientists call heliotherms. They use the sun, the helio, to thermoregulate, to control their body temperatures. They bask on the tops of rocks to warm up, and then 
they go beneath the rocks into the shade to cool down again. They can't just stay out indefinitely in the sunshine because they don't have another way, a physiological way to compensate for that increased temperature. They would get too hot and eventually perish. So as temperatures have risen in their habitat, in these hot desert environments particularly, well, the lizards have responded by doing what they've always done on hot days. They spend more time in the shade, but that comes at a cost because all the time that you devote to hiding under rocks is time you can't be out foraging for food. So as temperatures go up, the calories taken in by lizards go down. And Barry and his team had watched lizard populations wink out in a number of sites before they realized that it wasn't the heat killing the lizards directly. What was happening was that the lizards weren't getting enough to eat. In fact, it was the female lizards who couldn't get enough calories to, to build up the fat reserves they needed to reproduce. So that when things got too hot, the lizards simply stopped breeding. And you really don't need the PhD in herpetology to figure out the long-term consequences of that. So another climate change challenge has to do with what fans of the Jungle Book might call the bare necessities. The bare necessities of life, there, there, there's a whole song about it in that old cartoon. So what happens then when some critical element of a species habitat just disappears? And this is what we're talking about with the poor polar bear up on the iceberg, where as that sea ice dwindles, the polar bear loses the habitat that it counts upon counts on to, uh, to hunt its main food source for most, much of the year, which are these seals that haul out to breed on the ice flows. And when the ice flows disappear or become unstable, that bare necessity for those bears disappears. But if you could look over the edges of those ice flows, you would see another species that depends upon pack ice, a wonderful tiny little seabird called the little auk or dovekey that historically has always fed in the plankton-rich waters that are right along the edge of where the ice is melting. That strategy has worked for dove keys for thousands and thousands of years until the ice began to dwindle in places like this, Franz Josef Land, an archipelago in Russia, which is one of the places where dove keys breed. Because they breed on these isolated islands, Scientists had always predicted that dove keys would be one of the early casualties of climate change. Because if they must fly to the edge of the ice to gather food, to take back, to feed to their chicks, you can imagine that as the ice gets farther and farther from the islands, that trip simply becomes too long. They can't bring enough food back in a timely manner. The, 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 the chicks starve and the population collapses. This had been the prediction for years and years. But that brings us to a very important point. Nature is not defenseless. Nature is not a passive bystander to climate change. When things change, species react, and sometimes they do so in ways that we would never predict. So let us then catch up with this story of dove keys that again comes to us from the book and a conversation with this fellow here, David Grimelet, who is a French scientist, who participated in an expedition to a remote Dove Key colony in Franz Josef Land. We had indeed strong hypotheses and predictions on how they would behave, Grimley explained, noting that birds in their previous studies had regularly flown over 60 miles to reach the edge of the pack ice. We were expecting flight times between the colony and the foraging spot of at least an hour, he went on and then recounted what he called, quote, one of the most exciting moments of my research career. Sitting with their laptops at the dinner table, surrounded by their Russian counterparts in an old Soviet research station, they opened up that first batch of tracking data and saw precisely how long the birds had been in the air, less than four minutes. Instead of trekking all the way to the edge of the sea ice, the dove keys, had apparently found an alternative food source right on their doorstep. But what and where? It's easy to imagine the excited 
conjecture and conversation that came next, perhaps fortified with a few sips of vodka. Soon their ideas began to coalesce around an entirely new hypothesis. My colleague, Jerome Fort, remembered what we had seen while climbing the nearby mountain with our Russian friends a week before, Gremolet recalled, and described a distinct line across the mouth of the fjord where cloudy blue meltwater from island glaciers slammed into the dark, dense currents of the Arctic Ocean. Both Fort and Grimley had trained as oceanographers before they began studying birds, so they understood the consequences of such an abrupt transition. We both knew what this front meant, a curtain of plankton killed by temperature and osmotic shock. I, I don't actually completely understand the biology of osmotic shock, but I love the phrase. <laughs> For tiny crustaceans swimming so suddenly from one kind of water into another was like driving full speed into a wall. And for anything that fed upon those crustaceans, the resulting pileup created a bonanza. To test this theory, however, required a boat. And the only craft available was a, quote, chronically deflated dinghy. And the fuel they'd brought from Mermanx turned out to be contaminated with water. None of this was exactly ideal for exploring a polar sea, but they set off anyway and managed to sputter far enough out into the fjord for a survey. There wasn't much to see at first. But as they crossed the convergence between the glacial melt and the ocean water, the dove keys were suddenly all around them. The little auks were there, Grimley told me, aligned on the oceanic side, diving and stuffing themselves on plankton, easily picked from that underwater curve. Now, with that revelation, the story of dove keys and climate change switched instantly from one of decline to one of resilience. Yes, the sea ice was melting as the sea ice was melting as predicted, but so were Arctic glaciers. And in places like Franz Josef Island, where glaciers are still plentiful, that created an opportunity that no one saw coming. Gremelet and his team spent the remainder of their field season showing that dove keys weren't just surviving on their new food source, they were thriving. To Gremelet, the project demonstrated how one overlooked detail can have a huge effect on the outcome. Even if you think you know, he summarized, you really have to get out into the field to check what wild creatures are doing because they very often surprise you. Now, David Gremelet's story embodies something that I heard again and again during my research for this project, how scientists went into the field expecting to study one thing and ended up studying something else because conditions on the ground were so different from what they expected. Different in terms of climate, but also different in terms of the, the lives and the activities of their subjects. The dove keys were able to pivot quickly to a new food source because they have what scientists call plasticity. It's an idea that really does remind us of the old comic book character, Plastic Man, who had the ability of stretching his body into any shape at the drop of a hat. Well, like a good old Plastic Man, species that have a lot of plasticity have a built-in ability to adapt to new conditions, which is a critical thing to be able to do in an era of rapid change. They can respond rapidly. And in some cases, that response applies to a lot more than simply how they behave. And one of the best examples, if you were giving out medals that would take the gold medal would be the humble squid. It's a, 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 also known as the jumbo squid because they're so large, sometimes six feet in length just for the mantle alone. Now these creatures virtually disappear from traditional fishing grounds in Mexico's Gulf of California after a series of climate-driven marine heat waves swept through the area, and everybody assumed that they had done what so many creatures on the planet are doing now, shifted their ranges elsewhere, looking for the cold waters that they were used to. That's what people thought, until a team of scientists went down and did a survey and found that, in fact, the squid were still there, and in some places, they were more abundant than ever. Because instead of departing for cooler waters, they had responded to that heat stress by adopting a radically different life strategy. 
They matured and reproduced in half the time. They ate different foods. They lived half as long. And under those conditions, their new adult bodies reached only a fraction of their former size. You can see in this photo, before the heat waves with a huge jumbo squid on top and a fully adult jumbo squid on the bottom, a fraction of the size. The few that people were able to hook, they were throwing back, assuming they were juveniles or even another species altogether. They had become too small to bite the lures previously used to catch them. Now, most climate change responses that we've measured out in nature to date are some version of this squid story. Plasticity, abilities already there in the genetic makeup of species, ways that they're responding in real time, but there are also hints of evolution beginning to play out as a response to climate change on a time scale that we can measure. And one of the great examples comes to us again from another lizard species. And this comes to us from the Turks and Caicos Islands in the Caribbean, where Colin Donahue, who is now at Washington University, had just surveyed the local lizard population, these little anoles. They're sort of a, a small cousin of the iguana, if you will, a distant cousin, but related nonetheless. He had just surveyed this lizard population as part of a larger study on the effects of non-native rats. The Norway rat, you've probably got them in your compost heap right here on uh, Lummi Island. Well, they live in the Turks and Caicos too. And the idea was you go out and you measure all of these lizards and other creatures, native creatures in the habitat, and you get rid of all the rats and you see how the native flora and fauna respond in the air. That was the idea. But then a hurricane struck right after they completed their field work. And Colin's research took an unexpected turn. So let's pick up that story out of the book, which is from chapter eight, which begins with a, another quotation. This one from uh, Giuseppe Lampedusa's wonderful novel, The Leopard, where he wrote, if we want things to stay as they are, things will have to change. <laughs> Actually, it was two hurricanes, Donahue clarified, when I called to ask him how the story played out, Hurricane Irma struck first, pummeling the Eastern Caribbean with torrential rains, storm surge, and category five winds exceeding 175 miles per hour. Just two weeks later, Hurricane Maria swept through with similar force. The combined storms devastated low-lying islands like the ones where Donahue's lizards lived, uprooting trees, flattening structures, and leaving both natural and human communities reeling. Needless to say, researchers put the rat project on an indefinite hold. But for Donahue, that setback also offered an opportunity. While his questions about lizards and rats would have to wait, he was now in the perfect position to study the effects of hurricanes. Had any lizards survived? And if so, was that surviving population different from the one he'd just measured. We had no idea what to expect, he told me, but I knew we weren't going to get another chance at that kind of data. So he cobbled together some funding, headed back to the Caribbean and found himself in a sort of scientific deja vu, repeating the exact same field project he'd just completed six weeks earlier. We were on a short timeline, so it was pretty much catching and measuring lizards all day long, Donahue recalled, but he described the trip with obvious pleasure is this, as if this were precisely how anyone would want to spend their time on a tropical island. In conversation, Donahue's enthusiasm for science borders on exuberance. He comes across as someone who probably keeps working and thinking long after other people might quit for the day and retire to the poolside bar. That may be why he recognized the potential value of returning so soon to resurvey his lizards. And it's almost certainly why it occurred to him to bring along a leaf blower. The customs officer was very confused, he said, and laughed out loud at the memory of trying to explain the science behind traveling with a large piece of landscaping equipment. Well, we needed to know how lizards behaved in a hurricane, he said. And since it wasn't possible to stand there in a real hurricane taking note, he and his team decided to recreate one uh, on the porch of their hotel room. 
I've always wondered, I have to say, what uh, the people in the next room thought about that. <laughs> I mean, it's one thing if your neighbors have the TV on kind of loud, but a leaf blower all day long. Well, at any rate, Colin was kind enough to share with me a video he made of that experiment so that we can all see what he saw. Uh, and before I play it, I want to assure you that no lizards were harmed. There is a soft net uh, right off camera that caught all the lizards and they were all returned safely uh, to the wild after participating in this experiment. So now we start the wind with a modest breeze and you can see the lizard on the lee side of the stick. It's back legs, oh, see now it's whole body flapping like a flag in the wind and you get up to hurricane force and it grips and it grips and it grips and it grips until it can't hold on. And blows off into the net. And this is what precisely was playing out all over those islands during the hurricane. Now, in addition to getting a lot of hits on YouTube, when he posted it there, the video in that experiment perfectly explained the pattern that he'd been seeing in his data. Because it turns out that the survivors of those two hurricanes shared a suite of three critical traits. They all had measurably larger topaz, right? The hurricanes that survived had big topaz. The hurricanes that survived had big, strong front legs. And they also had short back legs. So the big toe pads were more gripping power and the strength in those front legs allowed those lizards to hold on longer. And he didn't, that, that made sense, but Colin said he didn't understand the short back legs until he saw the lizards with their bodies flapping like flags in the wind and realized that short back legs reduced the drag on their bodies in the windstorm. So the lizards that had those three traits could hold on a few seconds longer. And in many cases, that was the difference between life and death. So he went back then again later and saw these traits being passed down to the next generation. Then he looked at lizards all across the Caribbean and saw that in fact, this selection was directional. Any place you had frequent strong storm, the lizards shared these traits. And he realized that he and his team had documented natural selection, survival of the fittest in action, a step in the evolution of these lizards playing out not over the course of centuries or thousands of years, but really within a single field season. So climate change biology is all of just those sorts of surprises. And I hope that you will agree with me at this point that there's a lot more to it than a polar bear on an iceberg. Now we've talked about challenges like timing mismatches. We've talked about extreme weather. We've talked about plasticity, even evolution. And I have to tell you, we haven't even scratched the surface. Consider movement. Consider movement alone, migration, emigration. Between 25 and 85% of the species on the planet are already measurably shifting their ranges in response to climate change. Fanning out across continents and oceans in search of the temperatures and other conditions that they are accustomed to. Even at the low end of that estimate, that's a quarter of all life on earth. It's the biggest biological reorganization of this planet since the end of the last ice age. Now, climate-driven upheavals are impacting all kinds of fundamental ecological processes from competition to pollination, as we've talked about, to predation, to hybridization, parasitism, and yes, also extinction. This creature here, the mouse-like bramble key melomies in Australia recently became the first known mammal species confirmed as a climate change casualty when all of its habitat was inundated by sea level rise. So studying climate change biology doesn't make scientists worry less about this crisis, but it can help them to worry smarter, allocating scarce resources to the species that need our help the most. And that's important on a personal level too, as we all struggle to allocate our limited emotional capital to this crisis. We need to know what to worry about, and we need to know how to formulate our own response. Yes, climate change is a daunting crisis, but I argue that it deserves our curiosity as well as our concern, because after all, it's pretty hard to solve a problem if you're not even interested in it. 
Now, in a moment, I want to take any questions that you may have or any questions that our Zoom friends may have for us this evening. Uh, but first, let me end with a passage from the conclusion to the book. And this begins also with a, with a quotation, this time from the Bard himself. Shakespeare, who uh, in King John wrote, strong reasons make strong action. I subscribe to a philosophy expressed to me by Gordon Orion, an eminent American biologist whose seven decade career has spanned everything from blackbird behavior to the evolution of fear. When asked what a concerned scientist should do to combat climate change, his response was immediate and concise, everything you can. In that simple phrase, Orion's managed to capture both urgency and agency, the seriousness of the issue combined with the importance of taking action at a relevant scale. It's not a new idea. 19th century thinker Edward Everett Hale expressed something similar in a verse conceived long before anyone was worried about their carbon footprint. Quote, I cannot do everything, but still I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do the something that I can do. The value of the advice from both Orion's and Hale lies in their choice of the word can, a verb rooted in possibility and adaptable to any circumstance. It helps us focus our energy on tasks immediately at hand, tangible things, like how we drive, shop, eat, travel, protest, vote, and even cut the grass. Naysayers will claim that taking personal action is trivial, an empty gesture in the face of a problem so large. But that position is wrong, and not just slightly wrong. It is, in fact, the opposite of the truth. In nature, we have seen how the responses of individual organisms determine the fates of populations, species, and entire ecological communities. The same pattern applies to society. Addressing climate change requires a fundamental cultural shift in our relationship with energy, from how we produce it to how much of it our lifestyles demand. And that makes individual action more important, not less so, because it's the collective behaviors and attitudes of individuals that define and change a culture. Yes, we need stronger climate policies and strong leadership to carry them forward, but those things will be a result of cultural change, not the cause of it. Doing everything one can about climate change is also fitting biologically because that is precisely what plants and animals are doing. Their responses are playing out all around us every day, a constant thrumming call to action. Because in spite of the complexity of our societies and the technologies that we surround ourselves with, in the end, we're just one more species on a changing world, facing the same climate challenges and drawing on the same basic toolbox of potential solutions with one notable difference. Unlike any other organism on this planet, people have the ability to do more than simply react to climate change. If we so choose, we can alter the behaviors that are causing it to happen. Thank you. All. Thank you all very much. At this point, I would be happy to entertain any questions that we may have in the room or via the wonders of Zoom, the burning climate change questions that must be answered before you could possibly rest this evening. Yes, we have one right in the middle here. I was intrigued by your comment about the extent to which uh, Animals are needing to migrate and move. Yes. 85 percent something extraordinary. It's extraordinary. Yes. How's it going? Yeah. How's it going? So the question: What science saying is? Yeah. The outcome? You gave a couple examples of plasticity. Of the yeah. Uh, it's a. It's a. a Fabulous question. The question is, how's it going with all of these range shifts going on in nature? And your question reminds me of something that I heard from a wonderful scientist in uh, where, oh, the University of Tasmania, uh, Greta Peckle, who told me 
to remember if, as, as we're seeing these changes play out around us and all these animals like pelicans showing up in the Strait of Georgia for God's sake. Um, as we see these things playing out, she told me to remember that if a species can shift its range and survive, that is a good climate change outcome, right? So just because we may be seeing species we're unfamiliar with, or we may be no longer seeing some species that we once treasured seeing in our backyards, they're shifting their ranges elsewhere. If they can do that and survive, it's a great climate change outcome. And so we have examples where in fact, we, we can predict where the conditions are going to be favorable, at least from you know, general climate conditions, temperature and so forth, uh, uh, you know, other, well, a variety of things, but you know, using these various models to predict what things are going to be like and then where the uh, creatures should be at home. And we can see that in some cases they're getting there. There's a, a really wonderful bunch of studies being done on birds, for example, where you can see where they have lived historically and what the conditions are like, see where those conditions are likely to exist in the future. And then using even citizen science and so forth, look in those places and see if the birds are showing up. And in some cases they are. Now that's not the whole story though. And, and the reason there's no a single answer or, or even collective satisfying answer yet to your question is because so many things are in play. When you start to shift all of these species around, you're creating what we call in the aftermath, novel ecosystems. You know, collections of species that do not have a history or a recent history, at least for many of them, of interacting. And so all of those key ecological relationships then are being changed and unsettled, whether you're talking about pollination or predation or you know, parasitism, you know, hybridization, all of these things that connect species out in nature. Well, if you scramble all the species up, it's going to take a while for those communities to settle and to figure out what the long-term prospects of those species are. So what we know now is that a lot of species are on the move. Some of them at least seem to be headed in the right direction, but we won't know for a long time how it really works out in the end. Question all the way in the back of the room. Yeah. Uh, you know, you we don't have any death patterns, as far as I know, on the island. Um, do you think of anything else that you've seen within the San Juan that gives you this sort of information about the, the changes? But I was also wondering about how does this interplay with all the invasive or invasive uh, species that we already have? It's kind of thinking about that whole um, uh, red cross rabbit thing going on on, on San Juan Island. I mean, that, that clearly not wasn't there a couple of hundred years ago. Right. So what kind of interplay happens to something like that in relationship to climate change? And yeah, oh, oh, these are great questions. Oh, yes. All right, sit, get comfortable. We're going to be here a while. Uh, no, no, these are marvelous, marvelous questions. So other examples from our local environment here, start keeping your Thoreau journal. Start keep, you will see it happen in a matter of years. Start tracking the dates of flowering uh, in your own gardens, in your backyards, on the trail walks that you take around here. And what you will see is that the, the species that have the ability to flower early are flowering early. There are some traditionalists out there in the flower world, in the flower community, who are slow to change. But there are many species, shrubs, there are many species of wildflowers. It goes across the board that are, that are now flowering weeks earlier than they did. There's a wonderful data set uh, that comes to us from Yellow Island, right in the heart in the middle of San Juan, owned by the Nature Conservancy. Beautiful wildflowers, and they've kept track of flowering dates. Much There's something about living alone in a cabin. You've got to write this stuff down. Uh, and the caretakers out there have been doing it uh, for decades. And that's where we can see a whole suite of species of wildflowers, from the death camas to the blue camas, you know, to the Kalinzia, the little blue-eyed marys, all of these things 
responding to that rapid warming in air temperature. So it's really widespread, not every species, but the ones that have that flexibility are doing it. And it tends to give them an advantage. One of the very interesting uh, results of all the research now being done at Walden, where you have this wonderful baseline, is to realize that in fact, those species with that sort of uh, uh, phenologic plasticity, if you will, you know, the ability to change when they do stuff, right? It's just built in, they can do it. Oh, it's warmer, all right, here comes the flower, just like that. Uh, many of them then get an advantage uh, in that they get an earlier start. And the ones on the old schedule haven't leafed out, they haven't established themselves and, and they tend to be waking out. You see it in a lot of wildflowers there that were the early spring bloomers. And in that deciduous, heavily deciduous forest in the Northeast there, the whole suite of species that counted on the fact that the, the maples and the beaches and so on uh, were late, late to, a little bit late to the party. And so if you could, as a wildflower, get started early, you'd get established when you had full sun and you'd really have built up a, a big energy reserve before the leaves uh, came out on the trees and put you in the shade. Well, that's not happening anymore. The, the trees turn out to be pretty adaptable, many of them. So they're leafing out earlier and earlier and they're shading out a lot of the wildflower species below. So that ability to adapt quickly uh, is really changing the game for species and communities all over the place. So you can see it play out here in a whole range of plant species, particularly also insects in a variety of ways. So watch the insects, watch the plants. You won't be seeing it nearly so much in uh, things like birds, migratory birds, for example, in that their migrations, the ones that come to us from, from far to the south, you know, the neotropical migrants and species like that, their migratory patterns in many cases are triggered by day length. Right, so changes in day length tell them when to move. And of course, day, the, the, the patterns of day length are unaffected by temperature. So many of them remain on, on an older schedule. Some of them are arriving a bit earlier, the ones that get started and then take advantage of warmer weather. You'll see males showing up earlier for a number of species, but a lot of those birds remain on the old schedule. Um, and then, oh, your invasive species question. Oh, so, we look for these take home messages from climate change biology. And one of them is this, well, we, we can't look into the future and prognosticate exactly which species will be quote unquote winners or losers. There are themes and trends. And one of the major ones has to do with the difference between being a specialist and a generalist, right? And now a specialist is embodied by that death canvas example with the B, the, the specialization of that relationship. Specialized, specialization in nature is a wonderful strategy when things are stable because you can learn how to outcompete other species if you're really good at one thing. And we have the classic example with our uh, resident quote unquote orca population who are the best uh, out there at catching Chinook salmon and you know, you can go through huge schools of mixed salmon out there and, and pluck out the Chinook and just get them all. They're so good at catching Chinook uh, that they rarely catch other things. So now that Chinook are in steep decline, the orcas are suffering because they are specialized, right? So those specialist relationships then tend to be at risk when you're in a period of rapid change, whether it's from climate change or habitat loss or, or whatever else. Any kind of change, uh, specialization tends to be on the way as a strategy. The generalists, on the other hand, have a much rosier outlook in that they have taken the strategy of getting along pretty well in all sorts of conditions. You know, you have generalists like the common dandelion, for example, where you could take a dandelion seed and plant it in the gravel of your driveway and you would get a dandelion. And that dandelion would be pretty short. It's gonna have real thick leaves with a whole bunch of latex, real bitter, nasty little leaves. You could have taken that same seed, moved it over two feet to your well-watered lawn, and you could have been eating those leaves as salad grains, right? Because of the plasticity inherent in that species, that generalist approach to getting along in nature where they have the ability then to thrive in all sorts of conditions. Uh, and you can see that classic example between the, the common dandelion, this European now cosmopolitan species, it's everywhere, and the California dandelion, which you would be hard pressed 
to visually identify a difference. Yet the California dandelion is a specialist, it lives only on the wettish sort of edges of subalpine meadows in the San Bernardino Mountains, uh, a place that's changing rapidly due to climate change. Uh, and, and of course that specialist now, an endangered species in California where you can find the common dandelion everywhere. So in general, then we see this disparity in prospects between the specialists and the generalists. And if you then apply that to your question about invasive species, one thing that invasive species, these, these non-native thriving creatures uh, tend to have is, is a, a generalist attitude towards life. And so a lot of the, the changes that you see happening, many of them, the, the invasives will, will thrive because of their generalist habits uh, in general. Uh, and then also the fact that for so many of them, you know, they're outside of their native range. So they don't have the same suite of, oh, that bacteria and viruses and pathogens and predators preying upon them. So they're sort of freed from those encumbrances. The local species, many of them have not yet learned to eat them or to lay eggs upon them or what have you, infest them in some way. So they have that advantage and a generalist outlook. So their prospects are then good in a period where things are changing and they can take advantage of it. Wonderful question. And do we have another one or do we have any from the, yeah, yeah yes. Uh, we have, uh, we've had a lot of, um, Praise for your talk and gratitude to you for oh. me. Um, and I also have a question, which is, as flowers start earlier, is this one of the reasons encouragement of early bees like orchard mason is so important? Mm, yeah, well, that's a great question about flowers and bees. And yes, I mean, you want to, you know, if you have your, your orchard blooming earlier, you want your bees out there to be on it. And, you know, so the local bees that we have that are early risers uh, in the springtime are many of bumblebees, but very few, right? Because in the springtime, the only bumblebees to have around are the queens. So, I mean, I, if you're a fan of bumblebees, I hate to tell you, but all the rest of them die in August, September, October. Uh, the workers, the drones, they all perish. The colony collapses. And it's only the newly mated queens that then fan out across the landscape, uh, dig underground someplace in the leaf litter or what have you. And into a, if we're talking about cool words to uh, jot down for the day, hibernaculum is also a great word. And they, they live uh, during the winter in their hibernacula. And then they all come out in the springtime, early summer, and they start looking for places to start a new colony. So those pregnant queens are the only ones around. Some of them start early, so they are good orchard producers. And they do, since they're shallow in the soil, they have some ability apparently you know, to respond to warmer temperatures. And the mason bees also, if you have mason bees that are, I mean, they nest in holes, they nest in cavities. So out in the, in the woods, what they're nesting in are you know, uh, snags of trees that have old beetle holes in them and that sort of thing. But they'll nest in any little crevice. So they like human structures. They will nest in between the shingles on your doghouse. Uh, they will nest in the little grooves in a bar of surf wax. If there are any surfers in the crowd, you can get bees nesting in your surfing wax. Uh, so they are adaptable to some degree, and you can raise them then uh, in little paper tubes and so on, and keep them in an area, you know, keep them in the fridge over the winter in some cases, or out in uh, ambient conditions, and then make sure they're in a warm place in springtime. And they're able more than many species, more than a ground nester, at least, they're able to come out early. So yes, I mean, anything one can do then to encourage pollination uh, in those early weeks of springtime is becoming more and more important. I have one more uh, oh, question from Zoom, uh, which is trees don't migrate very quickly and in some cases run out of survivable conditions. What are your thoughts about assisted migration that may be tree species, species to shift? Do we know enough to do this responsibly? Oh, it's a great question. It's a great question. I, and I'm I'm going to I'm going to veer and then I'm going to come back to, to try to answer the, the whole question, but I'm going to veer first and say that, oh, actually. Trees move. And in fact, in some cases, they move faster than birds. Uh, so if we really want to know how trees are moving, it's not the individual, it's not the adult 
that we're looking at. If you look up when you walk through a forest, you are looking at the past. If you want to look at the future, look down and look at the saplings, look at the seedlings that are just coming up because they reflect the future of the forest. They reflect the, the trees that are getting established in the conditions we have today. The big ones reflect the conditions of, you know, in this neck of the woods, you know, 80, 100 years ago or more, right? So look down and you're going to see that in fact, in some places, the community coming in is very different. And if you then start to predict where trees are moving, what you're looking at is how the whole, again, range of that species is moving over time. And when you're looking at trees, what you're looking at to predict that range of, or to track it across the landscape is what we can calculate as the center point of the range of that species. So in other words, if you walked out into North America asking yourself the question, what is mathematically, what is the spot I am most likely to encounter a Douglas fir? You can calculate that spot. And that is the center of the range for that species. So if the temperatures are warming, if the precipitation is changing, if climate is changing, the, the center point of that range then is starting to shift as germination increases in certain areas and decreases in other areas, as mortality rates change, that center point starts to shift. You can track it if you have enough data on the seedlings and the adults in various forests. And the Forest Service has been tracking this stuff for decades. It's, and it, it's an incredible, uh, data set, public data set, go home and try to download some of this. It will gum, I don't care what kind of, you can be sitting on top of the fiber optic cable, it's going to gum it up. It's fantastic. <laughs> it's so much data. It's really, really great. Um, and so you can see then when you track the center point for these ranges, and you can do the same thing then with bird species, that for trees in Eastern North America, where they've really done these studies in detail, some of those tree species, the center of their ranges is outpacing the change that you see in birds. So they do, they do move. Um, but then the, to circle back to the, the, uh, the latter part of the question, assisted migration. What a fascinating idea. So if we know then that some species aren't making it fast enough, we know the trees are moving, some of them are moving, but some of them aren't. You know, and notably the Joshua tree, which is featured in the book, uh, uh, it's not moving. It's not moving fast. There are places where the conditions are getting just right for Joshua trees and you won't find them there because they can't get there. And one of the reasons they can't get there is because uh, 12, 14,000 years ago, uh, most likely due to our activities at that time, uh, their long distance seed dispersal, the giant, the Shasta giant ground sloth went extinct. And without that sloth in their habitat, the only thing that's really moving the seeds around are little kangaroo rats and pack rats and so forth. And they only move them very short distances. So you're not getting long distance dispersal for that species. So it's a really intriguing example then of introducing this idea of, of assisted migration. Should we then help a species like that that due to our other activities from warming the planet and killing off their dispersers, we've hindered them, should we help them? It's a, a very interesting question and one that biologists and botanists and everyone uh, are really grappling with now because you can see a real justification for doing it, but we know from uh, moving species around uh, in other realms from the invasive species and so forth that we've just been talking about from the great shuffling of species that we have ongoing with our range shifts all over the place. We know we're creating novel situations with unpredictable consequences. So there, it's a very active debate in biology right now. Yes, over here in the, on the side. I'm curious about what your comments on the, whether uh, the pace of change there's a uh, perceived acceleration in this transitory period that we're in. Yeah, so the, the question is, what about the pace of change? And, and it's a really great question. And, and, and the pace of change is vitally important in that slow changes are much easier to adapt to. We can all, I mean, in our own lives, we can see this, right? Rapid changes that come at us are much, you know, they're going to require 
you know, an extra cup of coffee in the morning to face. Uh, whereas things that change rapidly, we can yeah, get used to more or less. Well, the same thing plays out in nature. And one of the reasons then that we try, you know, to pick away at these policy changes that seem to make, or personal changes in our habits that seem to make you know, small potatoes difference uh, in terms of the rate of warming is that anything we can do to slow down the rate of warming buys time. And the more time we can buy, the more species will survive this crisis, right? Even if you look at an example like those wonderfully adaptable dove keys that we were talking about, you know, they have bought themselves probably at least about 180 years before all of the glaciers in the Franz Josef Land archipelago have melted and that food source disappeared. But at least that's, you know, almost two centuries of time bought for them to hopefully find another way to shift and pivot to a new source, hopefully on this changing planet. So anything we can do to buy time slows down the rate of change and increases the probability that species will be able to keep up with it, including our own species, by the way. Great question. 